Great. Okay, I'll get started. Um, so in this presentation, I seek to take stock of existing sociological research on young people's futures and some of the challenges associated with this. And then I'll discuss some potential ways forward. My focus is predominantly methodological and I'll spend the most time on an example from my own research that I believe illustrates some insights that can be taken forward or at least are worthy of discussion in terms of, of this bigger question of how to research futures. So before going further into this though, it is worth pausing a little bit and consider what we mean by futures and what do we want to know by researching futures. The future may be what Emma or Bridget calls a known unknown, but a growing amount of research on youth is engaged in studying young people's future aspirations and imaginaries and their orientations to the future. A starting point for much of this research can be found in the increasing uncertainty that is set to characterize life and late modernity in general, as described by Beck, Giddens and others, and youth transitions in particular, as pointed out by Carmen Licardi, amongst others. We can also view the interest in futures and futurity as part of a broader turn towards time in the social sciences, where issues of temporality and social time have seen increasing interest since the millennium. This suggests that we are interested in knowing both how young people navigate on certain times and make choices, as well as a more conceptual interest in temporality. And this is worth having in mind as we consider some of the tensions and challenges in, in futures research. So the first challenge concerns the relative attention devoted to the actual substantive imagined futures that young people might formulate or identify in the research um, or in, in, in interviews with us. If they tell us that they aspire to become a famous DJ and travel the world, what do we make of it? Or if they say they will move out of their local village as soon as they've finished high school, should we trust this to be true? Researchers are somewhat split on this. For instance, in the field of prospection science, researchers are interested in designing experiments to investigate whether people actually do what they imagine doing. Via behavioral and neural studies, researchers are interested in whether participants are imagining what they call accurate or inaccurate futures, or what, they, what is called errors of prospection. However, for most sociologists, our interest is not so much in assessing whether imagined futures are realistic or not. On the contrary, sociologists argue that even inaccurate or quote unquote unrealistic futures or future imaginaries of dreams have analytical potential. For instance, Valentina Kuzakrea and Juliana Mandic argue that quote, even if unrealistic, imagination cannot be reduced to unimportant ways of looking into the future. It does, in fact, open a space in the future and in doing so, ultimately define a range of possibilities for action, unquote. Analyzing the possibilities for action or the agency of young people becomes as important as mapping what they imagine futures look like. Julia Carabelli and Dawn Lyon take this even further as they argue that rather than the substantive content of um, what imagined futures might look like, we should focus entirely on the orientation to the future that is inherent in such future imaginaries. And we can see how this is linked to what Abedurai um, has called the capacity to aspire as a navigational capacity. A second challenge concerns how we perceive of the future and whether this is a destination that is separate in time, so separate from the present. Here, drawing on theories in the sociology of time, sociological research on young people's future orientations often acknowledges that these futures do matter for the present and also in the present. This has both a practical side to it, that planning for a specific future, such as becoming a DJ, may impact on what we do in the present to realize it, perhaps in the terms of making mu music mm. at home or build social capital. But also a theoretical or philosophical underpinning that past, present and future are not to be seen as separate timescapes, to use Barbara Adams' term, or different temporalities, but indivisible. And we can here think of Mead's notion of the perspective of the present as tying these dimensions together. A third tension, um, or maybe a challenge, concerns the methodological aspects of researching young people's futures. Much of this research relies on qualitative interviews and hence on verbal accounts. And Carabelli and Lyon emphasize the limitations of verbal or text-based approaches to studying futures, as these may generate um, short or relatively stereotypical responses all responses that can be said to rely mainly on cognition or conscious thinking rather than imagination or emotion. 
somewhat related to this challenge is the challenge to avoid relying on or reproducing chronological or linear understandings of time through the methods we use. So to try and alleviate um, some of these methodological challenges, some researchers have turned to creative and participatory methods um, in an attempt to facilitate alternative scenarios. Creative methods um, can be seen to go beyond the standard interview, interview as um, Bagnoli has termed it, and they can create new insights into topics that, um, or by making the familiar strange to us, or, um, and also by not relying solely on verbal accounts. It's important to note though, that these methods do not just automatically overcome some of these challenges. For instance, one common creative method in biographical studies is uh, what's known as life charts or lifelines. And this particular um, visual method or creative method can very easily facilitate chronological or linear perceptions of time. And likewise, um, Don Lan and Julia Carabelli's experiences with arts-based methods were somewhat mixed and posed challenges in terms of how to interpret some of the artistic and creative outputs. With this um, setup of background in mind, I'll now turn to an example of a specific creative method from my own research to illustrate some of the potentials of such methods. So in this case, it's an object method where participants were asked to bring specific objects um, to the interview. One object relating to their past and one that they associated with the future. While object-based interviewing is not in itself new, objects have, prim have primarily been used to elicit memories and narratives about the past um, or explore relations with objects. But in this paper, I seek to argue that objects also hold the potential for constructing narratives um, that project the participants into the future. So it is a future that is then within reach via the materiality of the object. The example that I'm using here, um, or this method, was employed in an ongoing longitudinal study of the everyday lives and imagined futures of young women who've left school early in Victoria here in Australia. Um, in this project, I followed the participants up to five times over the course of two years. So I interviewed them roughly every six months. Um, in the first wave of the interview, I had 31 participants and um, now in the third interview, I've had 18 participants. So there's obviously some people who drop out of this study. It is in this third interview that the object method that I'm speaking about here was incorporated. I'm not going to go more into the details around methods or data, but you can definitely ask more about it if you, um, if you want to know more about this. So in designing this study, I was inspired, with Jen but inspired by what Jennifer Mason has called facet methodology. And according to, to which facets are, quote, different lines of inquiry and different ways of seeing, unquote. So I used different creative methods in mm. each interview as, um, and seeing them as these to explore different facets of this um, topic or phenomenon that young women's imagined futures. Um, for instance, in the first interview, I had a sort of biographical focus and I used this um, life chart exercise that I mentioned before while the second interview focused more on space and belonging, and I, um, and I used a mapping exercise or drawing um, of, of their local neighborhood in the second interview. So the object method was used in conjunction with the third interview. Um, and I view these insights that I generate through this particular method as shedding light on other aspects or other facets of the research topic than these other methods. Um, and so I'm hoping or arguing that this multifaceted exploration produces a richer understanding of the topic in question. So before I turn to the data and the analysis, I'll just say a little bit about why I'm using objects or how I'm viewing objects and how I'm then analyzing the data. So objects um, can be seen as an integrated part of our everyday lives. In what's known as material culture studies, Objects are seen as tangible manifestations of more abstract culture, and it's as such that they become objects of study. Material culture studies is a broad and diverse field that has seen an increased interest in recent years. And this term, material culture, it brings together culture and materiality to emphasize how culture is materialized. In other words, how um, objects make concrete our cultural words, worlds, as Greg Noble has put it. According to the British researcher Sophie Woodward, quote, things are not just things, they're not separate to cultural or social relations, but they are an integrated part of them, unquote. 
Materiality is often associated with the properties and usage of things, but it also involves the affected capacities and aesthetics. And importantly, speaking about properties and capacities doesn't necessarily mean that I take this um, flat ontology like in Actor Network um, inspired studies. Um, instead, I follow um, the anthropologist Daniel Miller, who has emphasized the ways in which objects and subjects are mutually constituted in, in what he sees as a dialectic process. Um, so Miller's approach can be seen as a form of middle ground, and this is well suited to my analytical interests in this paper, which is how objects can embody biography, memory, and projection. So Miller focuses on practices and relations, that is, we need to consider the practices in which, in which objects are part and what objects come to represent, and including the social relations that they objectify. So objects can both connect us to other people across time and they can help us separate from specific relationships. And as I return to in the analysis, these insights become relevant for conceptualizing how the objects that my participants brought to the interview feature in their everyday lives. So bringing objects into interviews can be motivated by an interest in the object itself or by an interest in, in what does this object constitute? How does it, what role does it play in the participant's everyday life? Um, and in practice, many studies seem to move between these, these different approaches. Um, and in, up, in focusing on objects as a specific creative method, I'm not interested in exploring, for instance, the biography of the object itself, but rather how the object features in my participant's biographies. However, notions of materiality and use are still relevant as they help unpack the role of the object in the participant's everyday life. Comparing object-based research with visual methods such as photo illustration, Sophie Woodward emphasizes the material dimension as a unique strength. In addition to sharing basic features such as facilitating alternative insights and stories, she says, quote, objects engage you in, in ways beyond the visual as you may be able to touch, smell, or pick them up, unquote. So um, approaching this more analytically, I'm using or using objects to study memory and the past is not a new phenomenon. It's something that a number of scholars have explored um, and using objects to explore memories, biographies, etc. What objects do not seem to have been used for is to research futures or what participants plan, hope, and dream for the future. The future dimension is what a specific, um, a specific contribution of the object method as I use it here or see it here. And as mentioned, um, my variation of the object method asked participants to bring an object relating to their past and one relating to the future, thereby facilitating a dialogue that was already structured temporarily. With this double orientation in time, looking back to the past and looking ahead to the future, the object method engages with both memory and projection or anticipation. From the rich tradition of memory studies, we know that memories are not to be seen as a one-to-one -one representation of the past. Instead, memories are malleable, they're selective, and they're partial. Quote, memories are understood as personal reconstructions within the present, yet they include traces of the conditions of their production, unquote, as Julie McLeod and Rachel Thompson have put it. This means that while memories are reconstructions, they still hold a relation to the original event. How the event is interpreted, however, depends on the present. And this understanding of memory is underpinned by Mead's theory of time, in which he emphasizes the importance of the perspective of the present. Our participants tell about the pasts from the perspective of their present situation, and this influences which aspects of their pasts are emphasized, and then in turn, which future is seen as likely and ideal. There's always more than one potential life story to be told in a person's life, just like there is a range of imaginable futures. And as will be clear in the analysis here, this is not an important, and this is an important methodological point because it underlines the importance of paying attention to not just the interview situation, but also the broader everyday life of the participants when analyzing the data. So to unite these different temporal dimensions of past, present, and future, I take a narrative approach to the data. Narratives establish causal links between specific events in time, and it is through narrative that we make sense of experience and thereby of ourselves. So when my participants tell about the objects they brought to the interview, they're inscribing these in a narrative about their past, present, and future, 
which also produces a narrative identity for themselves. So at long last, I will turn to the actual method um, where participants were asked to bring a thing um, that reminds them of the past and one that they relate to the future. Some participants said already when I was messaging about the interview um, appointment that they knew exactly what they would bring and they looked forward to showing me. And others revealed in the interview situation that they had found it really difficult to decide what to bring, especially with regard to what was like the future object. Nevertheless, they all managed to select and bring these objects. I brought up these objects toward the end um, of the interview. And after briefly mentioning the task, I asked the participants to show me what they brought and tell about them. They often um, went on to give rich accounts of the objects and how they related to their past and future, although the narratives about the future were generally shorter. I asked participants if I could take a photo of the objects they brought, and I did so in most cases. The objects that participants brought along demonstrated a range of different takes on what they see as an object. Examples of the past objects were a tattoo, a scarf, a photo book, a keychain, a necklace, and school name badges, while examples of the future objects were a university course guide, a probationary driver's license plate, so a temporary driver's license plate before you get your full license, a glass of water, a necklace, and a tattoo. So potentially reflecting that this is a female-only sample, a number of participants had chosen a piece of jewelry. For instance, an engagement ring as their future object. But also one participant had chosen her engagement ring as her past object because she had ended the relationship. And furthermore, a number of the future objects related to study plans, education in some form, which may be reflecting the point um, of time in their lives at which I was interviewing them, but also my position as a researcher who is representing higher education and particular normative futures could also be shaping what participants wanted to bring. So going into the um, analysis of, of the data, I identified three different types of narratives that um, all interviews except one fit into. The first narrative depicts a journey. This is a classic narrative where the protagonist goes through a number of challenges and comes out wiser than before. The second type embeds the objects in a narrative about hope. And this narrative mirrors the journey narratives focus on challenges in the past. But rather than resolving these, the future is left relatively open though in a hopeful manner. The third theme inscribes the objects in a narrative about changing mindsets. And in that sense, it's more focused on the sort of inner life of the participant rather than external events. And I'll, so I'll illustrate each of these narratives through one particular um, case person. The first person is Shelley, and it's um, to illustrate the journey narrative. So Sh Shelley's, I'll just wait for the quote. Shelley's 18 years old and lives with her parents and two little brothers in a regional town. She tells how she likes school, but she was forced to leave halfway through the final year of high school because of a disagreement with the headmaster. After this, she found two jobs in retail and was also running errands for her elderly neighbors. At the time of the third interview, where she, she had recently enrolled in a diploma in childcare. When turning to the objects she had brought with her for the, um, with her for the interview, she said, which? I brought three things. So I'll start with the first one, and it's a name tag. In 2012, when I was in year six, I was transition leader, which meant getting the little kids ready for school. As in like settling the new kids who are coming into the school, starting prep, get organized. And that's when I, well, obviously I was in year six. I had no idea what, was going, what I was going to do with my life. And she picks up the next item. It's another name tag. Year 12 representative, big time of my life. Then I failed, big mess. And then she picks up the third item. This is my childcare batch representing my future. So these are my two pasts and that's my future. I could not imagine myself being anything different than working in childcare. And I just love the connection that you have with the people, parents, kids, whoever you're looking after. But like just being able to care for them because I've always been a caring person, um, like for my brothers, protective, caring. I felt like I've got to care. Like that's my role in life is to care for people, be there and help them in any way. So Shelley's three objects were all related to school, illustrating her attachment and investment in this and also underlining how for her not being able to complete year 12, the final year of high school, was a dramatic event and, so, and perceived as a failure that caused a big mess, as she's saying. 
Already in the previous interviews, she has emphasized how she was forced to leave school and the injustice she felt in relation to this. For Shelley, starting the childcare program meant finding her see, calling. Um, and through this, she's realizing what she sees as her true self, as this program allows her to make a career out of her caring personality. So it's a future identity that is represented by the childcare name badge. Being able to hold this badge, show this to me, make this future concrete. She's already on track to this future and the badge is the material proof of this. Her story, like a number of other participants' object narratives, follows the classic narrative form where the protagonist is on a journey and faces a challenge which they endure and overcome. And in the next quote, um, she elaborates on this journey, playing how not completing year 12 felt like the end, um, an outcome associated with ending up on social benefits and never having a career, but also describing how she avoided these prospects by working hard and starting her future. So she's saying, I had a lot of trouble with my past, um, the past object, what to choose, because I've got this big memory box full of all these memories, like the first rose my boyfriend ever gave me, my first ever boyfriend, photos about everything, movie tickets, like literally everything. But I couldn't find, there was one that I was tempted to bring and it was my Deb Corsage, it's like a debutante ball corsage, the one, um, the corsage flower thing that's on your wrist because that was, that was the happiest day of my life, this particular ball. Like that's my favorite day if I had to put it. But it's just the kind of day that doesn't relate to anything. Whereas I felt with these objects, the objects she brought with name badges, in year six, Obviously, I had no clue what was coming for me. I was just chilling out. I thought the drama I had in year six was big drama. It was not. Year 12 was a very good but bad year for me. Year 12, I loved it so much. I was doing great. It was very stressful. I failed it. I thought that was the end. I wasn't going to be, my plan at the time, a paramedic. I wasn't going to have a career at all. I was going to be a bum living off Centrelink, so like social benefits. I had, I felt like I had nothing going for me. And then halfway through that same year, I got myself three jobs and I, learned, I later on got accepted into my childcare program and I started my future. So reflecting on this object task, it's clear that selecting one single object to represent her past was a challenge for Shelley. So while she had all these memories, as she's saying, gathered in a box, the objects she has chosen to bring come to tell a more general story about her life rather than representing what she calls a day that doesn't relate to anything, like the corsage. The memory box itself demonstrates how various objects from her past are still part of her life today. However, it's worth reflecting on why this particular item, the corsage, is not seen to be a proper or worthy object in the interview context. So one potential explanation can be found in the above illustration of Shelley's commitment to school and having a career, and the sense of injustice involved in being forced to leave school. Her chosen objects become inscribed in a narrative that depicts her as a school-focused, engaged student, and it sort of proves them wrong when expelling her from school. And it also demonstrates to me as the interviewer that it was a wrong decision. Methodologically, this example also demonstrates how the objects cannot be meaningfully analyzed without placing them in the broader context of the participant's life as it's narrated in the interview. So moving on to Bridie and what I call the hopeful narrative. Um, this mimics the journey narrative above, that I just talked about above, but it doesn't have the same sense of resolution. Illustrating this um, is Bridie, who was 18 years old at the time of the first interview, and she lives with a partner on the outskirts of Melbourne. Bridie grew up with her mother before the mother committed suicide, while her siblings, her three younger brothers, they lived with her father. Bridie was the only participant who asked me to clarify what was meant with when bringing an object. And she was also the only participant who was really unsure if she'd met the brief. So she's saying here, I bought a whole handbag full of crap because I'm like, I have no idea where to start, but I think I have something. I think I have something. I think it's kind of stupid, but it's, I'm trying to say, this is not something where they can be, I wanted to say be right and wrong, but she's saying, I don't know if I'm using this in the right context, but I'll try and see what happens if I can find it here in the bag. Oh, I don't know if this is gonna to work, to be honest. And I don't know if this is morbid or not. I really don't know. Yeah, no. Okay, so this is a necklace and, oh crap, hang on a second. Let me untangle it. There we go, fixed. It's a necklace with, what is that thing I'm saying? Oh, is it a half moon? And you can see the image here. Um, is it a half moon? No, what is it? 
and she's saying, it's a half necklace and it's half of my mom and half of me. Right, this is silly, but unfortunately my mom is in my past. I'm saying, oh, that's a beautiful idea. So you, so you bought these, like this is the heart, the half hearts. Yes, I actually put half of it on my mom and I buried it with her. Really? Yes, that's beautiful. Oh, it's a bit silly. No, it's not. Oh, I thought it was a bit strange. But unfortunately, mom is in my past and putting it on her was in the past as well. And unfortunately, my mom can't move with me to the future. But even though things are in the past, doesn't mean that you don't, it doesn't mean that you forget about them though. So while Bridie mentions the whole bag full, full of crap that she had brought to the interview, she only goes on to show me two objects, one for her past and one for her future. But the opening to the quote here demonstrates the lack um, of confidence in the object she's chosen and whether she's misunderstood the request from me. Perhaps this is emphasized by the very personal and sensitive nature of the object she has chosen for her past, a necklace where one half is with her mother in her grave. Bridie told about her mother's death already in the first interview. However, telling about the necklace lays open the loss and the grief associated with the event, and it demonstrates the gravity and importance of the object um, when I ask um, whether she wears her own, her own half or her own necklace, to which she replies that she's so scared of losing it um, and it would be pointless if she bought, just bought a replacement if she lost it. Instead, she keeps the necklace in her jewelry, jewelry box and this changes the necklace from a piece of jewelry to be worn to a commemoration of her mother. The quote also demonstrates how the necklace comes to bridge past, present and future, as it is a way for Bridie to keep her mother and the memory of her mother with her, even though she can't move to the future with me, as she says. In fact, the materiality and the durability of the necklace is almost seen as transcending time, as Bridie later describes how it's always going to be there, as she says. It's a permanent reminder of her mom. So moving on to talk about the, ob the object she's brought for her future. Um, she's saying, yeah, my future one. It was so hard to pick, but you're going to laugh at me and I'll tell you why. I brought a pea plate. So this is this green pea plate you can see here on, this, on the side. Um, so it's a plastic um, piece of plastic that you put in your car to demonstrate that you are on a probationary license. She's saying, yeah, it's so strange. It's a bit bent because it was in my handbag. But the green pea, pl pea plate, it's a bit dirty too. The green pea plate is my future. Because with the green pea plate, I can get my job and then I can move on to bigger and better things. So while this is a rather brief quote, it relates back to a conversation we'd had earlier in the interview where Bridie described how she is not eligible for her dream job as a home nurse because she needs the full driver's license for this. Getting the license, the green pea plate, feels like the key to unlocking a future with what she thinks is bigger and better things. And holding the green piece of plastic in her hand makes this future feel within reach. Moving on to bigger and better things also refers to finishing her studies as she hates studying and she struggles to keep up. So for her job is clearly better than being a student. In fact, Bridie reveals that she has actually been offered a home nurse job with a start date six months later where she expects to have the license making this particular imagined future all the more likely. However, she's careful to not, uh, what, as she says, get my hopes up in case it doesn't happen. So she's protecting herself from this potential disappointment. In that sense, and in contrast to Shelley above, Bridie is less confident that her future plans will materialize, even though these plans seem within reach. Instead of narrating her present and indeed future as resolved, she's leaving it somewhat open as something to hope for, but not count on. Narratives of hope can indicate a sense of lack of control over the future. But in Bridie's case, this may be less about not being able to imagine a future as all as Brian and Ella have suggested, but more about not having um, much confidence in her own capability to affect what happens around her. So moving on to the last uh, type of narrative that I find in these um, object um, interviews, I've called this the mindset narrative in lack of a better word. And this narrative is somewhat different to the two narratives um, just mentioned here. Instead of focusing on events alone, specific events come to represent different subjective orientations. And so to illustrate this type of narrative, I used the interview with Anne. Anne was 23 years old at the time of the first interview. Um, she has two small children and she lives alone in a regional town three hours from Melbourne and she's on maternity leave with the youngest child. 
In previous interviews, she's described complicated family relations, including physical abuse from her brothers and a strained relationship to her mom, who she feels favors her brothers. Anne herself was kicked out of home after she fell pregnant at 15. Her past object is a photo album that she brings out. As we flick through the pages together, Anne is telling about the photos and the people in them, pausing to emphasize family resemblance, resemblances and events that specific photos relate to. She's saying, it's literally my photos of my family history and photos of me up until I got on drugs and went like mental and ran away. My mom made it for me for my 20th birthday. I'm saying, oh, can I look? She's saying, yeah, I was adorable. If you look at that photo of my mom and then you look at me on the front page, you can see how strong the family genes are. So when did you say you got this for your 20th birthday? I asked, what did you think when you got it? And is saying, I was confused because when mom, when I left home, mom always told me that I'd never get any of my childhood photos, like I didn't deserve them. And then she gave me this, the album, and I was like, oh, cool. And say, right. And so how was it with, because I know you've been telling about, I guess, especially the relationship with your brothers was, was quite problematic in some ways. So having all these photos, how has that been? Was it always as strange or was it not like that? She's saying, yeah, I tend to just look at myself and ignore them in the photos. That is because I refuse to acknowledge the negativity right now. They just don't exist for now. So is it a book like that? You know, you take this out of the shelf and you look at it every now and then. And she's saying, yeah, like I post photos on Facebook. I randomly break that book out, find a photo of myself when I was like a baby. I post it and some people think that I'm just photo posting photos of her baby daughter. It's good because sometimes I look at photos and I have no memory of them. And then I look at them in a few weeks and there's like faint memories that sort of come through. And I'm like, I think I remember wearing this jumper. Like I remember little bits, but not necessarily all of it. It's good because years of drinking and other stuff sort of messed with my memory a bit. And it's nice to be able to look at it and remember some things. So I'm saying, you feel like it's almost like getting those memories back? And she says, yeah. And then if I'm ever confused, I just ask mom. Oh, sorry, this is the rest of the quote. If I'm ever confused, I just ask mom. Hey, you know, so with this, did this happen? And she's like, oh, well, sort of. But I, it was actually this way. And I'm like, oh, cool then. So yeah, it's sort of helping me piece my brain back together a bit. So photos are common in memory research because they seem to be ideal prompts for conversations about past events. And as this quote illustrates, Anne's photo album is not just stored away, but it's an object that she uses to and she returns to it every now and then, not least to repost some of her own childhood photos on social media platforms to show the resemblance between herself and her baby daughter. This album is also instrument, instrumental in what she, said, what she calls helping piece my brain back together with the photos facilitating the memory of specific events that she thought were lost to come back. The photo album, in conjunction with her mother's recollection of events, come to serve as proof of what actually happened, demonstrating her eagerness to get it right. The quote also signals that Anne is in some ways leaving the negative experiences and fraught relations of the past behind by ignoring her brothers in the photos in an attempt to sort of refuse to acknowledge their negativity right now, as she's saying as well as involving her mother in her own memory reconstruction. And this reorientation becomes more pronounced when we turn to her future object. Ah. Um, so this has jumped out of the slide, but I will read it here. Saying, so what is your future thing, the thing that you relate to your future? Yeah, I'm finally taking care of myself and I'm doing what I want. And then she so shows a large tattoo on her entire thigh or upper leg saying oh my goodness this is enormous yeah it's not even done yet i'm going i'm going to wrap it around my thigh first and then go down my leg i'm saying okay after she's told about the tattoo how does this how is this the thing you relate to your future she's saying because i need to stop spending so much time you know focusing on other people and trying to make them happy and in the future i want to spend more time doing stuff for myself making me happy this is like, this is actually about making me happy and not relying on everyone else and not doing everything for everyone. So I'm saying, oh, so it's a bit like self-care, looking after yourself a bit. Yeah, yeah, she says. It's gonna be good because I've been doing everything for everyone for so many years. It's about time I had some stuff for myself. So with this future object, it becomes clear how Anne's object narrative centers around changing her own mindset from pleasing other people to doing what is good for herself. She tells how the tattoo is something she's wanted since she was a small child, 
and saw a tattooed person for the first time, despite these negative comments from her family. The decision to get this done, make, to get the tattoo, was something she um, decided after splitting from her partner, the father of her baby daughter who had an affair. It becomes her way of reasserting herself and prioritizing something that she herself wants. So having the tattoo, now this object is not only a source of joy and pride when looking at it, but it's also a daily reminder of her promise to herself. And from a methodological point of view, this example demonstrates perhaps more clearly than the two preceding examples, how the materiality of the object is doing something to the interview situation. The photo album makes the situation different than if we looked at photos on a phone or simply spoke about some of the events and people depicted. So having the photo album there between us means we can flick through this together, we can pause on certain photos and ignore others. I can feel the texture, the thick cover and the weight of the album as a whole. It's a proper formal album that few, at least young people own today. It's not just a collection of photos printed hastily on a home printer. In this way, the object method allows for a materialization of culture in a way that other creative methods do not readily do. So to sum up first on the analysis and the object method, I hope that I've demonstrated how the method here used in combination with the grounding in material culture and a narrative approach produced some new insights into the pasts and futures of the young women. In particular, I argue that the method was productive in terms of creating narratives about tangible futures enabled by the materiality of the objects. So this, this means that these are the future objects are not just at abstract futures or generalized um, aspirations, but they are what I'd call futures already in the making. The futures with the participants are actively trying to make happen mm -hmm. and which they have taken steps towards. And the objects become the tangible proof of this. Shelley is already enrolled in the program that will lead to her dream job. Bridie has the P-plate ready for when she gets the full driver's license. And Anne has already started prioritizing herself and her own needs more by getting the tattoo. So in that sense, the object method has particular benefits that seem to alleviate at least some of the methodological challenges related to researching futures, that is the abstract and generic accounts that these sometimes create. The materiality of the object is likely central to this. First, the fact that participants have been allowed to consider which objects to bring outside of the interview situation in another time and space means that they have reflected on the objects beforehand in a space that's their own and not defined by me as a researcher. And second, the objects also provide a concrete anchor in the interview situation, something to touch and look at, something to probe into in terms of use. Um, but it is worth considering which objects that sort of seem to be able to make it into the interview. And we saw how Shelley had reflected on what was a proper or acceptable object to bring. Likewise, the fact that a number of participants brought jewelry or objects relating to education suggested the object method is not free from normative ideas around what storylines they should be pursuing and presenting in the interview situation. So to just take a step back and consider what, um, what sort of broader takeaways um, we might take from this in terms of how to research futures more generally. Um, there's a few points that I think um, are worth dwelling on. So first, creative methods can, but don't automatically do, generate data that's different from, from what you can say the standard interview. And this is because these methods allow us to step out of the conventional frame of mind and somehow serve as a breaching technique in Garfinkel's terms or Garf in Garfinkel's sense. This makes them better suited to investigating effective, imaginary or pre-verbal dimensions of young people's futures. Second, I would argue that both a holistic and a multifaceted approach is important. This means situating the data from the object method in a broader narrative, not only in the interview, but also previous interviews, if, if it's a multi-wave, multi-interview study. This also means exploring multiple facets of a phenomenon or researching futures from different aspects, like Mason's facet methodology approach encourages us to. There are multiple possible futures to be told, depending on the time horizon, but also on the present situation and how the future in that sense is approached in the interview. Um, and, and I think this is worth um, having in mind what, how these different sort of points of entry can facilitate different insights. Third, individual future narratives must be contextualized, not just by 
the whole, in the interview, but also embedded sort of social, socioculturally. So that means we need to consider the possibilities that are available to our participants in terms of formulating specific futures. And this means paying attention to dominant cultural tropes or institutionalized, dis institutionalized discourses, for instance, around education or mobility or so on, that can be seen as setting the parameters for which stories and indeed futures are legitimate and in that sense, tellable. And lastly, um, I believe we should take seriously that not only the past is clo closely tied to emotions, but the futures are too. Our research methods and conceptual frameworks need to be able to accommodate and capture this dimension in addition to investigating navigational capacities and projectivity. This seems even more relevant in the current moment where we're facing not only um, uncertain environmental futures, but also pandemic and economic recession that is predicted to follow in its aftermath. I will stop here. Thank you very much for listening.